Hello everyone! Today's video was requested by Genetically Modified Skeptic, so let's jump right in. Hi everyone, my name is Drew and I run the channel Genetically Modified Skeptic, link in the description. If you like content related to atheism, counter-apologetics, and scientific skepticism, then check out my channel. But for now, on to the video. As Master Yoda famously said, death is a natural part of life. In the end, all things die. We're born, we go through life, hopefully spending it with the ones we love, and then we die. Eventually, our bodies are unable to sustain their necessary metabolic processes, and we shut down for good. As long as there have been organisms, there has been death. Individuals die, populations die, whole species die, millions of species are wiped out in mass extinction events, like the one we're in currently, never to roam the planet again. We often think about death more in the short term, but what about the long term? Life can exist without several elements, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and a few others, which are recycled in ecosystems through what are known as biogeochemical cycles. Eventually, Earth's carbon will be sequestered in limestone and other sedimentary carbonate deposits as continents inexorably grow. This will ultimately deprive living organisms of the carbon they need for routine physiological functions. As organisms are unable to find carbon, they will die. Plants, protists, and prokaryotes will be forced to live with lower and lower carbon concentrations until they reach a critical threshold. And once that threshold is crossed, life on our pale blue dot will be extinguished. Long before that happens though, the photosynthetic life struggling to gather carbon will have greatly reduced in biomass, meaning the oxygen content of our atmosphere will also drop precipitously. But hey, that's only a problem if you need oxygen for respiration or something. There is an interesting possibility that some type of life could evolve in the future which isn't dependent on either carbon or oxygen, but the odds of that happening on our planet are probably remote. As plant life disappears, Earth's albedo will rise because plants have a low albedo, meaning much more light will be reflected into space. This will lower Earth's temperature as deserts expand in size. Billions of years from now, the star that sustains life on this planet, the sun, will grow until it engulfs the Earth and disrupts the motions of the other planets in our solar system. This is due to hydrogen being fused in the sun's core to make helium, which raises the sun's temperature. As the Earth heats up, the land will become barren and water molecules will dissociate. Our comfortable home will become a kind of new Venus before it's completely wiped away. Intelligent design indeed. Already, numerous stars in the night sky, probably including one that you've so sincerely wished upon, have been dead for millions if not billions of years. And trillions of years from now, all the stars will die. The universe will become dark and lifeless as it reaches thermodynamic equilibrium. Now, this surely seems bleak. Everything and everyone we know will cease to exist at some point. For many, this can be frightening, so it's no surprise that so many turn to religious doctrines for comfort. The thought of living forever surrounded by loved ones can, you know, if you don't think about it too hard, ease the existential dread caused by recognizing our insignificant place in the universe. It's therefore no surprise that religions place humans at the center of the universe, some literally, with direct or indirect access to the most powerful being or beings of all time. But that's a discussion for another video. The point here is that death is inevitable. It comes to us all given enough time, but as the title of this video indicates, we're not going to focus on death in general here. Today, we're going to talk about what happens to whales in particular when they die, which is the topic I suggested for Jackson to cover because, to me, it shows that life's inextricable relation to death need not always inspire sorrow. Often enough, it can provide a sense of wonder. It does to me. From here, I'll turn things over to Jackson. Thanks, Drew. When whales die, one of two things can happen. They get stranded on beaches due to tidal forces, or sink to the sea floor. Contrary to what one might think, though whales are so heavy, they don't actually sink immediately. As decay occurs, the gas in the whale buoys it to the surface, where it can be fed upon by various fish, sharks, and seabirds. 
Over time, the gas is released, and the whale then proceeds to slowly sink to the bottom. Once there, it will be feasted on by a host of scavengers, including grenadiers, hagfish, sleeper sharks, octopuses, crabs, lobsters, polycate worms, sea snails, and more. Because organisms on the seafloor are so sparse compared to surface organisms, they must rely in part on dead organisms drifting to the depths. Although whales sinking to the seafloor probably occurs frequently, researchers only extremely rarely get glimpses of it. In fact, one of my favorite YouTube channels is EV Nautilus, in which a group of researchers pilot a submarine to take videos of marine life. In one of those videos, linked in the description, the team comes across a decaying whale carcass covered in octopuses and grenadiers, both of whom strip the whale of its tasty meat. Much smaller than them, polycate worms like Victorniella flocati and Osidax antarcticus also participate in the feeding, reducing the carcass to bones. Osidax in particular is extremely important because this worm, also aptly known as the zombie worm, breaks down the whale's bones. Strangely, these worms do not have a stomach or mouth, which is rather peculiar for something that feeds on something as hard as bones. Instead, Osidax grows root-like structures that secrete acid to penetrate into the bone, allowing bacteria to get in and enzymatically degrade the tissue. The root-like structures absorb the nutrients released by the bacteria, while on the outside end, the worm forms feather-like plumes that function as gills for respiration. Overall, these worms superficially look a lot more like plants rather than worms. They spend up to 10 years scavenging the remains of a single whale. The symbiotic bacteria then support a variety of organisms by producing hydrogen sulfide, similar to what occurs at hydrothermal vents. In fact, these zombie worms are closely related to the giant tube worms that live close to such hydrothermal vents, as they both belong to the polycate family Siboglinidae. Traces of these worms have also been found on the fossilized remains of sea turtles and plesiosaurs from the Mesozoic 100 million years ago. This indicates that they are generalists, being able to colonize the bones of different vertebrates, as they had done for a long time before whales came around. In 1994, a team of researchers documented a whale carcass in Santa Catalina Basin near California and found that the chemoautotrophic bacteria supported a community of some 43 animal species. These include the clam Vesicamaya, the mussel Idasola, the snails Pyrapelta, Coculina, and Matrella, the worm Bathycurilla, the anemone Actinoscyphia, the starfish Terraster, the sea cucumber, Panakea, as well as some vertebrates like sablefish and rockfish. 80% of the scavenging fauna was just bivalves and gastropods, occurring in much higher frequency at the whale carcass, meaning the whales act like temporary population centers. Later, a 2003 paper described how the community living on and in the whale carcass changes over time. Indeed, the researchers outlined three stages of carcass fauna the mobile scavenger stage, the enrichment opportunist stage, and the sulfophilic stage. In the mobile scavenger stage, sleeper sharks, hagfish, grenadiers, and invertebrates remove the soft whale tissue, which can take several months. The enrichment opportunist stage then occurs over months to years where opportunistic polycates, such as osidax and crustaceans, converge on the carcass. Finally, the sulfophilic stage can occur over a decade in which the aforementioned chemoautotrophic bacteria support dozens of species on their metabolic byproducts. The paper also points out that this process would have likely occurred in deep time involving analogous opportunistic species. Carcasses of the Eocene whale Basilosaurus probably supported chemoautotrophic communities, as did earlier sauropsids like ichthyosaurs, plesiosaurs, and mosasaurs. In fact, whale skeletons dating to 30 million years ago from Washington State were found in association with several fossil bivalves, such as mytilids, thiocerids, and leucinids, all of which have modern members that participate in chemoautotrophic carcass communities. Further, the Jurassic ophthalmosaurus has been found in association with the tusk shell prodentalium, and a middle Jurassic plesiosaur was found in association with the bivalve Nicaniella. 
Even an Eocene leatherback sea turtle has been found in association with bivalves that inhabit modern whale carcasses, such as Osteopelta. Surely, large teleosts and sharks have also supported such communities. What worms and bivalves inhabited the decaying maw of Dunkleosteus? The fact that whale carcasses support such a large and diverse community of organisms raises an interesting possibility. Could whale skeletons function in dispersing organisms across the abyssal depth? Many abyssal organisms have obligate symbiotic relationships with chemoautotrophic bacteria, so they cannot venture too far from the hydrothermal vents and cold seeps that support the bacteria. However, the bacteria can also grow on the whales, so various animals that are normally restricted to vent regions can grow a substantial distance from these locations. Thus, whale, sauropsid, and fish carcasses could serve as stepping stones for bivalves crossing the abyssal plains over generations. Whale carcasses also act as environments intermediate between more rocky hydrothermal vents and soft sediment localities, providing a wider range of substrates for animals to adhere to than they would normally be exposed. This is evident in vesicomyid clams. Vesicomyids common to whale carcasses occur in a broader range of substrates than vesicomyids that only inhabit vent regions. So whales may not only be geographic stepping stones, but evolutionary ones too. Other studies have shown that hydrothermal vent mytilid clams are descended from cold seep mytilids, which in turn are descended from whale carcass mytilids. Suffice it to say, dead whales are extremely important to both the biogeography and evolution of benthic fauna. Death may be the end for the whale, but it is the beginning of life for various mollusks, worms, and bacteria. Nutrients are recycled back into the environment, and life, unyieldingly, goes on. So, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.